You know, I like uh, to read novels and to watch movies, but one thing I can't stand is a novel that never edits, and it's all about description and character development and a tiny little bit of plot, and nothing happens that furthers the plot, right? I like a story where everything goes with the plot and furthers the plot, right? Well, our story today is like a rabbit trail in the story of Jesus. What's up with this story? Why did he stick this in there? We're talking about the only story that Luke, I mean, Luke's the only one that included this story. The other gospel writers didn't include this. It's when Jesus was 12 years old. It's before his bar mitzvah at 13. And of course, there's all this debate about why did he go at 12 instead of 13, you know, we don't know. Apparently, Jesus' childhood wasn't all that important to the other gospel writers. They didn't include anything until he began his ministry about age 30. We don't even know that for sure, but we think that's when it was. But Luke gives us these two little stories about Jesus' childhood, which is kind of unique, isn't it? Last week, we talked about when he was a tiny, tiny baby, just over 40, over about 40 days old, maybe, came to the temple, parents carried him in, and old Simeon there pronounced on him that he was the salvation of Israel. And we talked about that last week. Well, I can see why Luke thought that was important, salvation of Israel. But our story today is just this little thing that's thrown in, and you can't, so I'm wondering, why did he put this in there? It just describes this boy, but that can't be all it is, right? Or you wouldn't have put it in there. How does this story further Luke's point? That's the question. Oh, and of course, he's writing to Gentiles. He's a Greek guy. And so he's writing to Gentiles, and he's, he's showing that the salvation that Jesus provided wasn't just for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles too. Of course, the religious leaders don't want to hear this. They want it just to be for Israel, because they thought Gentiles were worthless, and pagan, and all these things. They didn't want to hear it. So one of the threads in Luke's gospel is how these religious leaders were offended by Jesus' message, his teaching, and they eventually killed him for it. That's the thread. So today's story shows their first encounter with Jesus in this context. And this time, as a boy, when he was 12. Luke starts by describing a boy who would be every parent's ideal child. And then he scares him half to death. And he goes back to being every parent's ideal child. Well, let's read this. It's uh, Luke 2, 40 to 52. It's a little bit long, but it's a story. The boy grew up and became strong, filled with wisdom, and God's grace was on him. Every year, his parents traveled to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom of the festival. After those days were over, as they were returning, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming he was in the traveling party, they went a day's journey. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple complex, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all those who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Oh, why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them, and his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. All right, do you notice something? Luke says twice that Jesus was wise, and it's kind of like bookends on either end of the story. It gives you a clue on what the story's about, really. But Jesus was not only wise and knowledgeable, he was nice about it. You know, an awful lot of people get to be, when they're real smart, they get to be, you know, <laughs> annoying. Not Jesus. He was a gracious boy, it says. Today that sounds like he had graceful body movements. You know, that's not what they're talking about. 
It means he knew how to deal with people. When the grace of God is on you, you know how to deal with people. Maybe we would say he's polite or generous or, you know, I tried to think of a word that, there, we don't have any word that means this word anymore because I can't use the word gracious anymore because it means graceful. So I typed the word gracious into a thesaurus. You're gonna like this. And all these words taken together give a really interesting view of the character of Jesus and therefore of God. Here's, the, here's what they say. It's uh, accommodating, affable, amiable, approachable, compassionate, considerate, cordial. Isn't that cool? A 12-year-old boy is cordial. Courteous, friendly, genial, good-natured, hospitable, loving, polite, sociable, well-mannered, amicable, benevolent, and my favorite, big-hearted. I love this boy already. Wouldn't you love such a son? Big-hearted. Personality of Jesus and therefore of his father. Must have been of Mary too, don't you think? Yeah, okay, well, let's see why Luke included Jesus' first visit to the temple when he was 12. I wonder what Jesus thought of that temple. Think about where he grew up. It was a, a little tiny town, a small village in the fringe of Israel territory in Galilee where Gentiles mixed with Jews more than other places in Israel. From this rural area, he walks for three days with the adults and the other boys from Nazareth. The villages apparently went together to these festivals. They climb to the legendary city on top of the mountain, Jerusalem. And there they so shoulder their way to the magnificent golden temple that rises like the sun rising over the city. And what a sight for a young man. Next year, he's going to return here for his bar mitzvah, but this year they bring him so that he knows what to do when he gets there. After lecturing, the teachers sit with the students and with others who want to talk more about what they were talking about. And they ask questions and discuss answers. Kind of, I've, it was referred to as the Socratic method. You know, the teacher sits there and it's a discussion, really, with the teacher. Jesus is really good at this. He's an inquisitive boy. He's eager to learn, and he's respectful in his answers and in his questions. Ideal student, as far as I'm concerned, as a teacher. I've had some of these kind of guys. Well, the teachers, of course, enjoy his stimulating company. And they love having him in the class, and they all stay till long past time to go home. And apparently, Jesus stayed overnight in the temple at least one night. There's a bunch of dis explanations about how this three days his parents were looking for him thing, because they were off a, a day off, and then they came back and searched for a day. And you know, anyway, people are always trying to figure out these things. I wonder what his parents thought Jesus was doing all this time if he wasn't with them. Well, I'm sure Jesus thought the same thing about his parents. Well, actually, what did he think? He probably thought they were just around like usual. You know, your teenager, your parents aren't there. Well, they're just around, you know, like they usually do, visiting with family and friends, right? Isn't that it? When the big families get together and the kids are off, are they worrying about what you're doing? No. Well, that's Jesus. He just thought they were around. So when they came up, and asked him why he hadn't gone with the other boys in the village as they started home. He was surprised. <laughs> what? Surely they knew where he, where he was. That's where he had been. That's where they left him, and that's where he stayed, in the temple, with the teachers. So he's going, why were they so scared? I'm just here. You can just hear this 12-year-old, right, <laughs> in his head. Why are they angry with me? He was confused. Jesus is confused. He asked, why are you looking for me? OK, let's go for a full stop. Boom, right here. What's the point of saying his parents don't understand him? I mean, who understands a teenager? This is not unusual. So Luke is making a point. 
He's hinting at who Jesus is when he says this. It's when people begin to sense how unique this boy is. It's where those who are closest to him don't understand him, don't understand what he's doing, don't understand what he's saying. It's over their heads. That's what Luke is saying. Already at 12, Jesus is over their heads. But I think, I think the teachers in the temple did understand. I think their relationship with Jesus starts here when he was 12 in the temple, wowing them with his questions and with his answers. And that is what he did with these religious leaders all his life. At first, they just saw him as a cute kid and patted him on the head. But they surely knew only too well where these questions were leading. But of course, a 12-year-old is no threat. He's just cute. As a man, however, even his own hometown hated him for being so uppity. Matthew tells us about this. It's uh, Matthew 13, 54 to 40, 56. He went to his hometown, Nazareth, and began to teach them in their synagogue. So they were astonished and said, how did he get this wisdom and these miracles? How'd they come to him? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Aren't his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Can you imagine somebody coming into Bad Lake that's like a, some got super famous and came here and everybody's like, where'd he get all this? Can you see it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sister, aren't they all with us? Where does he get all these things? Well, of course, if we go back to Jerusalem, the same religious leaders who are amazed at this precocious boy would be humiliated by the know-it-all man. Luke shows us the style of Jesus' teaching and how his knowledge of scriptures nails him and humiliates him, infuriates him, just like he infuriated the people in his hometown. This graceful man is infuriating everybody. <laughs> There's a disjunct there for me. This is example. There is one in Luke uh, 20, 39 to 47. Jesus had just humiliated totally the, the Sadducees. He'd wasted them by answering a trap they'd given him about the resurrection and all these wives of this guy and all this stuff. And so when, after he wasted them, the scribes were approved because they hated the Sadducees. See, this was the deal. And so they replied to Jesus, well, teacher, you have spoken well, he said. <laughs> and that shut the, the Sadducees up. They didn't dare ask any more questions. <laughs> but Jesus doesn't let the scribes off the hook either. Instead, he turns to them in verse 41. He says, how can they say the Messiah is the son of David? See, there's the question, right? For David himself says in the book of Psalms, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If David calls him Lord, how can he be the Messiah? How can the Messiah be his son if he calls him Lord? <laughs> well, that attack on the interpretation of the scriptures of the expert scribes was bad enough. But then he continues to humiliate them in front of everyone in verse 45. While the people were all listening, and we've heard in other places they were all really gleeful about the way he's hammering all these people they didn't like. He said to his disciples, now listen, the scribes are there, right? Everybody's listening. But Jesus is talking to his disciples. All right? And he knows everybody's overhearing, right? So he's talking to his disciples. Beware of the scribes. He says, they want to go around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the front seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. But they devour widows' houses. Now they're all listening, right? And they say their long prayers just for show. They will receive a greater punishment. He's talking to his disciples, though. He's not talking to them, right? 
You can see why they hate him. But Luke is telling us that this confrontation started back when Jesus was 12. The same sort of religious leaders and perhaps the very same men are the ones who send him to the cross. Livid with rage. And Luke said it started at 12. But you know, underneath everything, in the total background that nobody seems to be talking about, because this is what nobody talks about, right? Who is the real dad of Jesus? That's really what's underneath all this. Who is Jesus' real father? It's not Joseph. Well, after this, Joseph disappears from all the accounts in all the Gospels. Right after Jesus says this in verse 49, when he's asking his parents, and here we're coming to Luke's point, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Who is the father of Jesus? That's what Luke is saying. The father of Jesus is not Joseph. The father of Jesus is almighty God. Whoa. So as a son of God in the flesh, Jesus questioned the religious leaders in the temple when he was 12. And as a man, he attacked them. Even to the point of throwing him out of the temple. Eventually, of course, these same religious leaders will kill him with a lynching. Well, that didn't work out so well for him either. Because it turned out that Jesus was in fact the son of God. And the gospel writers all report that he rose from the dead, ascended back into heaven where he'd come from. This time, he brought humanity with him in his human body. Then he sent the Spirit to dwell in everyone who believes in him at Pentecost. This is the same story written by all the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the disciples, all of them, became convinced that Jesus was the Son of God. And look at John. John is his cousin, right? They lived really near each other. They were probably boyhood friends. John had probably grown up with Jesus. And he believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Can you get that through your head? Your boyhood friend is the Son of God. Well, he must have seen what Jesus was like growing up as a boy. full of grace, knowing how to deal with people, compassionate, honorable, big-hearted, unusual, unique boyfriend. And then he became a man. He began to see Jesus turn water into wine. He's more than my friend, <laughs> you know? They all believed in him. They all went to martyrdom for this man that they knew was the Son of God. And that's the point of the Christmas story. There once was a boy born as a baby, a real human baby, welcomed by angels, celebrated by shepherds, worshiped by wise men who had been studying apparently the Hebrew scriptures and knew who this boy was. This baby had grew into an amiable boy who seemed to absorb knowledge like he was just remembering it. His mama would tell him over and over and over the story of how Gabriel came to her and, and gave her the prophecy and he had this memorized in his head, the story of his mama. He remembered the story about the angels the shepherds told him about and the wise men, he remembered that. He might have remembered that himself. Hey, what was he, two? Possible. I remember my diapers being changed at two, so there. Jesus knew even as a young child who his real dad was. Yeah, can you imagine? He had no doubt about this. He loved to be in the presence of his dad. He loved to kind of talk things over with dad, you know. Well, we call it prayer, but for Jesus, it's just talking to his dad about everything. 
So we can imagine how it felt when he went to that temple for the first time. Magnificent golden temple that everybody called his dad's home. Now, how he loved to discuss all that his dad had put into the scriptures, all the things that were there. He heard his dad's voice in there. He wanted to never leave the temple. And he had to go back home to Nazareth. And he waited and he waited in Nazareth. He had to lead his brothers and sisters after his dad died. He had to pick up the carpenter business. He was the carpenter in town. He waited and he waited and he waited. And then one day, his heavenly dad told him the time was right and he went to the Jordan River and John the Baptist called him out and baptized him. And Jesus, for the first time, heard his dad's voice. This is my beloved son. I'm well pleased with him. Oh, how that must have felt for Jesus. My dad's proud of me. I'm doing good. It wasn't just river water running down the face of Jesus that day. The love of God filled his heart and overflowed his eyes with joy. My daddy loves me. Can you see this? Is that how you feel too? Almighty God loves you. You're, he's your father too, like Jesus. It's the whole point. It's the whole thing. It's the whole story. Christmas and Easter and Pentecost. Daddy loves me. That's what Luke is telling us. Almighty God wants to adopt you into the family of God. He wants to invite you to be a child of God, just like Jesus. Jesus, our big brother, he knew how to do it. He constructed it. He filled out the right papers, talked to the right people, made it possible for us to be adopted into the family of God. Jesus, our big brother. And now he stands at the door ready to welcome us home. Will you walk through that creaky door that always seems to jam when you try to open it, that screen door? Can you hear the spring when you try to open it? <laughs> Think you know, life is like that when you try to contact God sometimes. It's like that squeaky door just keeps jamming on you and you can't get it open. Well, Jesus fixed that door. You can walk right through. He loves you. Come home to Jesus. You can do it just by believing in him. Like his brother, his cousin John did and all his friends and disciples. Same thing. He loves us. He's welcoming us home. And that's the story of Christmas. Amen.